If we head to the Siebengebirge uplands in Germany, we'll find a hill named the Drachenfels near Königswinter. It stands at 321 metres and the name translates as Dragon's Rock, named after a dragon that allegedly lived on its slopes. It's also not far from the Lorelei Rock, so named for the seductive water nymph that apparently caused countless boat accidents. Ruins of a 12th century castle, the Burg Drachenfels, cling to the top of the mountain. The castle is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, in the area. Protestant Swedes destroyed the castle in 634 during the Thirty Years' War and it was left ruined. The Drachenfels even appears in Lord Byron's Child Harold's Pilgrimage. But given we're in the folklore of Mountains and Hills Month, let's investigate two legends associated with the Dragon of the Drachenfels in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We're rattling along with the folklore of Mountains and Hills Month, and before I go any further, this episode is brought to you in Sesame Street style, in association with both cedar and fennel, both of which meant strength in the Victorian language of flowers. So this week we're going to have a look at the Drachenfels in Germany, and one of the reasons why I decided to pick the Drachenfels is because in fact it's somewhere that I'd actually been, and obviously I do like where possible to actually include things that I have actually got some personal experience of, particularly if I'm going to places outside of the British Isles. And as I say, the Drachenfels is beautiful. And I was actually there in 2013, which kind of makes me feel a bit old because it sort of feels like it was just yesterday. But anyway, so we're going to crack on with it because as I say, there's dragons involved in this one. So they're always good for legends and what have you. But I want to give you a little bit of an idea of the background first for one of these legends because the Drachenfels is an early location in the Nibelungenlied, or Song of the Nibelungs, a Middle High German epic poem that was written in around about 1200. Now, the epic poem actually takes two parts, and in the first one, we hear the story of Siegfried, who marries the princess Kriemhild, and then the second part focuses on Kriemhild and her later marriage to the King of the Huns. Now, the Nibelungenlied went on to inspire Richard Wagner's epic opera Der Ring des Nibelungen in 1857, although that one was actually more based on the Old Norse version of the poem than the German version, and it also inspired Fritz Lang's silent film duology Die Nibelungen in 1924. Now, it is worth bearing in mind that certain groups have misused interpretations of the poem to identify characters with nationalistic ideas, with Siegfried particularly associated with German nationalism. So it does have some problematic associations now, anyway, compared to when it was first written. I'm not going to delve into the wider plot here because that would be an episode in and of itself. But we're just basically focused on the Drachenfels because we're looking at mountains and hills. And this particular hill appears in the third chapter in which Hagen von Tronje tells the king about some of Siegfried's adventures like up until that point. There are different variations on the story because there are different manuscripts for the poem. And this particular version comes from Eugen Hollerbach's Rhine Legends published in 2007. So in his retelling, Siegfried was a Franconian prince and grew from an adventurous boy into a headstrong warrior. Having exhausted the possibilities for excitement at home, he set out to gain more experience of the world. He travelled along the Rhine, eventually coming across the land of the Nibelungs, dwarfs famous for their skill in crafting. Siegfried sought work as an apprentice and the king himself agreed to take him on for a year's training. Now at the end of that year, Siegfried discovered that the king had secretly been crafting brilliant treasures – Upset that the king didn't trust him enough to let him help, Siegfried lost his temper. This becomes quite common throughout the poem, but never mind. He snatched up one of the hammers and slammed it into one of the anvils so hard that it drove it ten fathoms underground. The king realised at this point that Siegfried's strength far outmatched his own abilities and he tried using flattery to calm the hot-headed hero. Eventually, he asked Siegfried to run an errand for him to collect charcoal from the brazier of a mighty giant. Normally, the giant brought the charcoal to the king, so Siegfried was at least familiar with him. But unbeknownst to Siegfried, the king had left instructions with the giant. If he ever sent anyone to the giant, the giant should kill him. 
So when Siegfried arrived at the brazier, the giant seized him by the throat. Siegfried realised he was in trouble and managed to wriggle free. When the giant uprooted an oak tree and swung it at Siegfried, the hero ducked and lashed out with the sword that he'd made himself. In so doing, he severed the giant's foot, and when the giant fell to the ground, Siegfried darted forwards and severed his head too. He set off back to the Nibelungs, tired and furious. Now, the king didn't expect to see Siegfried again, so in his absence, he'd laid out all his treasures so he could admire them. When Siegfried returned and saw the treacherous king, particularly with all of this plunder, rage seized him. Siegfried dispatched the king and then hid all of the treasure under the floor. And he basically goes off in search of a better hiding place. Eventually, he found himself on the Drachenfels, and he came upon the scene of a village preparing for the annual sacrifice of a virgin to the dragon that lived on the hill. Siegfried caught sight of her and felt so awful for the weeping maiden that he actually hurried up the hill to try and save her. Only killing the dragon would end its reign of terror. Now Siegfried took a steeper route up the hill than that of the villagers and reached the dragon before they did. The dragon roared, furious that this young man stood before him and not the terrified girl he normally devoured. But the dragon had thick scales and horns along his spine, so he didn't fear Siegfried. He crouched down for a better look at the hero and Siegfried attacked, but his sword merely glanced off the beast's neck. The dragon breathed a thick plume of fire at Siegfried, but he dived out of the way. Irritated by the show of bravado, the dragon opened his jaws again. Now this time Siegfried threw a bundle of dry wood into the dragon's mouth and it caught fire in the dragon's flames. The dragon screamed, thrashing his head in pain, trying to dislodge the burning wood from between his teeth. In the process he exposed the soft flesh of his throat, so Siegfried drove his sword into the dragon's weak spot and the dragon fell to the ground. Now some of the dragon's blood splashed onto Siegfried's hand and when he looked closer he realised his skin had become hard like the scales of the dragon. He threw his clothes off and coated himself in the dragon's blood, realising it would make him invulnerable too. He did manage to coat himself everywhere, except for a spot on his upper back between his shoulders where a linden leaf had fallen. By the time he realised, the dragon's blood had dried. Siegfried decided it would probably never be a problem, given he would probably always have armour on anyway, so he hacked off the dragon's head and went back down the hill. He freed the maiden, rebuked the villagers for not fighting the dragon, and then took the maiden back to her people. Siegfried returned to the Dwarfen Forge and retrieved the treasure, and he then took all of that back to the Drachenfels, to the dragon's cave, and then buried the treasure where no one would ever find it. Now, you might have guessed that the story ultimately doesn't end well for Siegfried, because the business with the dragon's blood does sound a lot like the story of Achilles in Greek myth. Now, Achilles' mother, Thetis, makes him invulnerable by dipping him into the river Styx, but because she holds him by the heel as she does so, she creates his weak spot that still bears his name to this day, the Achilles heel or Achilles tendon. We're not going to dwell into what happens to Siegfried next because we're just looking at the bit on the Drachenfels, but that is essentially the story of his encounter with the dragon. In some versions of the story, the dragon's actually called Fafnir, so in some ways it's almost worse than killing the dragon when it has an actual name but it's not the only legend associated with the Drachenfels. And another tale actually takes us back into the mountain's pagan past and was retold by Lewis Spence in his 1915 book, Hero Tales and Legends of the Rhine. Long ago, a dragon lived in a cave on the Drachenfels. The pagan peasants worshipped the creature and offered human sacrifices. These helped to stem the dragon's appetite, keeping it from eating farm animals and local people. Two warrior princes, Rinbod and Horsric, often raided the Christian settlements across the Rhine, seizing captives to offer as sacrifices. One day, they got their prisoners back to their own land and started dividing the captives. A Christian maiden caught their eye, and such was her beauty that they fought over her. Both wanted to marry her, but neither would relinquish their claim. When they couldn't solve the argument through words, they decided to fight with weapons. The victor would win the maiden. Now, the priests finally intervened, not wanting to risk losing skilled warriors in combat, and they decreed that since neither could decide who would have the maiden and a Christian one at that, they would offer her as a sacrifice to the dragon. For some annoyance, the princes agreed, but Rinbod secretly hated the judgment. He'd actually fallen in love with the maiden, seeing her as more than just a prize, but his pleading with the priests got him nowhere. She would die the following day. The next day, the priest led the maiden to a clearing outside the cave and tied her to an oak tree. The dragon always emerged at dawn, so everyone waited in the half-light of morning for the dragon to appear. 
As you can imagine, the villagers murmured with excitement, keen to see the dragon devour the devout Christian. Horse Rick watched with some disinterest, glad that if he couldn't have her, no one would. Runbod, however, watched with a heavy heart. The calm resolution of the maiden impressed him. No warriors entered battle with such a steadfast spirit. Dawn broke and the dragon hauled itself from the cave. Smoke drifted from its nostrils and it bared its fearsome teeth at the onlookers. Still, the maiden seemed to show no fear. She greeted its approach with a hymn, singing praise for her god while the dragon roared. It grew close enough to pounce and the maiden made her move. She held out her crucifix and the dragon threw itself to one side, desperate to evade the holy symbol. It lost its footing and crashed over the side of the cliff and fell into the Rhine below. The villagers dropped to their knees in shock and awe and Rinbod ran down to free the maiden. Despite the best efforts of the priests, the villagers chose to convert to Christianity. Rinbod finally married the maiden and built Berg Drachenfels in her honour. Now while we've lost the maiden's name over the centuries, the legend still marks her bravery. So what do we ultimately make of these two legends? And that's one question to ask, but perhaps a better question to ask is, did the legend come first or the name of the hill? And I only ask this question because Lewis Spence notes that some people doubted the authenticity of the legend of Rinbod and the Christian Maiden. I mean, it does feature an actual dragon, so you can sort of see their point. Yet these same people thought the name might come from Trachetfels, meaning Trachite Rock. And as Spence explains, another hill near Mannheim bears the name Drachenfels and has a similar geology, albeit without the legend. Now that said, Spence does doubt somewhat that, and I quote, the people of antiquity would bestow a geological name upon any locality, end quote. So he seems to think that people in years gone by wouldn't have given a spot a geological name, they would have to have had a legend to go with it. Now that said, people have quarried trachyte ore on the hill since the era of the Romans, so these quarries, while they're not in use now, obviously have some age to them, shall we say. And builders actually use stones from the hill to build the St Maria im Capitol church in Cologne in around about 1000 AD, so it's entirely possible that the name does come from the geology and the legend came later to explain the name choice. Now perhaps that's why it became such an obvious location in the Nibelungenlied, Either way, the similarity between the Siegfried version and the Spence version focuses on a maiden being sacrificed to a dragon. So where one hero frees her and returns her home, the other one marries her. Now there's no sense that Siegfried frees her because he fancies her, rather because it's the right thing to do, which perhaps makes his victory more noble overall. Although obviously if you do know the rest of the story, you kind of feel like you would have been better off just staying with the maiden and kind of like making a life with her, but that's a side issue. Now, I do highly recommend a visit to the Drachenfels if you are in the Cologne or Bonn area. You can take a tram to the top of the Drachenfels and then walk back down, as I did in 2013, or you can actually walk all the way to the summit if you're more ambitious. And I should point out, I remember when I came back down the mountain again after I'd been up to the top, it's really, really steep, like more than you would expect it to be. But you can visit the ruins of the castle at the summit for excellent views of the Rhine, and also there are other things to see on the mountain as well. So you've got Schloss Drachenberg, which stands a little bit further down the hill. And that was built by Baron Stephen von Sarter in 1882. Now it's a neo-Gothic confection. But surprisingly, Sarter never actually lived at the castle, choosing instead to live in Paris. So it was never actually lived in in his lifetime. And Sarter died in 1902 and his nephew, Jakob Biesenbach, actually bought the castle from the state. He was the one who first turned the castle into a tourist attraction, although it was then converted into a Christian boarding school in the 1930s. It did house a Nazi elite school in the early 1940s before US soldiers occupied the castle after the war. And it essentially swaps hands quite a lot of times until it becomes a listed monument in 1986. And as I say, it's well worth a visit. It's absolutely gorgeous inside. And it's the kind of thing that you'd almost expect a Hammer Horror film to be filmed there. Like, it's really got that sort of baronial gothic thing going on. It's absolutely beautiful. And there is also a museum partway down the mountain called the Nibelungenhalle, which is dedicated to the Nibelungen saga. And there's also a reptile zoo as well. The dragon's den next door reputedly marks a spot where Siegfried defeats Fafnir. And there's a massive stone statue. Now, I've got the picture of it on my blog and obviously in the YouTube video as well. It's huge and I was reading on the website that apparently its head somehow fell off so they've had to kind of repair the statue since I was there but if you like dragons it's well worth a visit and if you also just like reptiles in general 
it's well worth popping in as well. So there's various different types of snakes and other lizards and whatnot as well. But that is the legend of the dragon on the Drachenfels. As I say, I wanted to focus a little bit more on the parts that dwell on the actual hill itself rather than all the stuff to do with Siegfried because, as I say, that poem has a lot more going on in it. So, yeah. Ultimately, though, which legend do you prefer? Feel free to let me know. It's always nice to see which versions people like. Obviously, we have had dragons on Fabulous Folklore before because I did the dragon tales in the northeast. We've got the Laidly Worm of Spindleson Hoof and the Lambton Worm, perhaps the most famous one that I can think of, at least in this region. So we have had dragons before, but this is like a proper fire-breathing dragon. And I, it, it's it's described in various different ways. and it's, it, There's lots of coils involved. So it almost sounds a little bit like a worm as well, rather than a smog-type dragon. But again, uh, you can imagine it whichever way you want, I think, really. Whether it had any treasure or not, I really don't know. But obviously Siegfried did bur bury treasure in the cave. So I guess he kind of created the dragon sword after the dragon was already dead. But anyway, as I say, I hope you enjoyed that. We will be continuing next week with something else. Haven't decided what yet. So if you do have any requests, please do let me know. I am also still debating what theme to do for December, but I was thinking as we're sort of coming into like Christmas ghost story season, it, I may do something to do with ghosts because I've sort of exhausted Christmas plants and trees. But if you've got, again, any specific requests, as always, let me know. So anyway, have a marvellous week ahead and I'll see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance. <laughs>